Joining a professional body has never been more important. Join thousands of other professionals just like you who are getting ahead with CIHT membership. Go to the CIHT website and discover exclusive resources and why the leaders and future leaders of the sector are members with CIHT. Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. So how safe are our roads? This week, data was released on reported road casualties in Great Britain, providing provisional results for 2021 and some mixed reviews, it's fair to say, from the results. To unpick the details of this, I'm delighted to be joined by David Davis, who's a Fellow of CHT and Executive Director of the Parliamentary Advisory Council for Transport Safety, PACS. So welcome to this podcast. I'm your host, Justin Ward, and you're listening to CHT's podcast, Transport Talks. David, welcome. I think almost to understand the scale of the problem, we need to go back to 1896 to a story that started in Crystal Palace, not actually far from where I live. And it was Mrs. Bridge Driscoll. Can you just explain what happened and briefly about the numbers of road deaths that we've seen since then in Great Britain? Justin, thanks very much for inviting me to this podcast. And uh, yes, I think that's an excellent place to start. It's also close to where I live. So uh, we, I think we both know the location well. Uh, poor Mrs. Bridget Driscoll is famous for being the first person to be officially recorded as, as, as killed by a motor vehicle in Great Britain. And uh, it occurred in, in what is now the Crystal Palace Park. And the coroner at the time, at the inquest, said he hoped that such a thing would never happen again. And he was tragically misguided. And since the current series of, of, of road casualty records began, which was actually uh, some some years after Mrs. Bridget Driscoll was killed in 1926, there have been just shy of half a million people recorded as, as killed on Britain's roads. Now, if you take into account the Northern Ireland figures, which are not in there, if you can't take into account all those which are simply not recorded, and of course, going back before that period, um, we're well beyond a half a million. And that, that is a huge number of deaths from one source. And uh, although the numbers have come down dramatically, I'm glad to say, it's still far too high. It's still a major cause of death, if not the largest cause of death and injury for certain categories, such as such as young men. And, you know, we still have a long way to go. It's interesting you mention young men, actually. Sir David Spiegelhalter, who's a, a, a very recognised and eminent statistician, did some interesting analysis that showed that the pandemic had been a net lifesaver for young people. So if you look at people between 15 and 30 in 2020, he identified that 300 fewer died than would normally have died. And that includes the 100 that died from COVID, sadly. So that was 300 fewer families mourning the death of a young person because young people were essentially locked up. They couldn't go out driving fast. So obviously road deaths avoided was a component of that. And obviously you said that young people are at much higher risk. In terms of the road statistics during the COVID period, particularly during lockdown, we'd seen a, a, a diminishment of the, the numbers of fatalities and serious injuries on roads, but it has picked up a little bit. Could you just say a bit about the figures that have been released? And then particularly, I think the thing that was picked up in the media was the, the highlighted concern about e-scooters and data on that. So a bit about what the what the release data was this week from the department. Yeah, sure. Um, it's always good to follow David Spiegelhalter, Professor Spiegelhalter. He's, he's a wonderful uh, interpreter. I think he, he was Professor of the Public Understanding of Risk, which is a fantastic, um, and he's, he's really very good at it. Um, I'll try. <laughs> so yes, this week, and give Department for Transport credit, they've published the figures earlier this year than ever before, so good for them. We've had the um, headline casualty figures for Great Britain for 2021. And as expected, uh, the numbers have risen compared with 2020, which was an atypical year because of the lockdown and the substantial absence of traffic, particularly in the first half of the year, apart from cyclists who took advantage of it. So, yes, we've seen a 7% increase in deaths since 2020. But I think more importantly and more encouragingly, compared with the two or three years before, uh, you know, the first lockdown year, the number of fatalities, for example, has de- 
declined by um, 12 percent department of transport say and it's it's sort of similar or slightly greater figures for serious injuries so if we look at the sort of long-term trend, although what you know the department would has has been describing it as a plateau over the last ten years, there has still been a, a gradual downward trend, and and last year, 2021 was encouraging, but we don't know how typical that is. I think you know the economy and society and all sorts of things and traffic levels and uh, uh, so on are, are still adjusting to um, to the COVID situation, so. Um, we know there have been big changes in casualty patterns. For example, in central London, there are far fewer pedestrian casualties now in the centre of London because there aren't there just aren't so many people there. On the other, on the other hand, the, you know, the, it's more prevalent now in outer London. So there's a lot, there's a lot in that, and we'll look forward to the detailed figures in September. Um, but you mentioned e-scooters, so yes, the department has also published a fact sheet on e-scooter casualties. I think they've expedited it because the government has announced it's going to legislate to um, legalise e-scooters and they recognise that not only are the rental trials relevant, but also the, the private use, the illegal private use, which is um, far more prominent, frankly, than, um, than, than the rental scooters. So they've published those and that's very interesting. There's been an almost 200% increase in reported casualties. It may not be quite as much. I suspect that they underreported the previous year. But anyway, um, that, that's that, those are the figures. So we're looking at over 1,200 casualties, 39 fatalities. Without in any way criticising those figures, PAX has also been tracking that and we are aware of 12 fatalities on e-scooters last year. So those figures may be adjusted by DFT. But anyway, that, that's, that's a, they have pointed out that as a, a, a new phenomenon in the figures. Um, so those are sort of the bold, you know, the bold um, headline stats. And, and, and PAX has done a report on that, on the safety of, of, of e-scooters, but also just this change generally in micromobility that we're seeing that, the, I guess it's particularly in cities, there's this contested space that's been used lots of different vehicles lots of different forms of mobility and does this bring into question how safe system thinking needs to evolve to adapt to that changing environment do you think there's a a kind of paradigm shift in 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 thinking required it's quite a big question and it probably requires yeah, it just is. a slight a slight pause on the safe systems thinking just to, to explain that is is about the idea of people shouldn't people make mistakes and they shouldn't die or get uh, seriously injured as a result of something that they do on the the transport network. So it's down to the systems designers to ensure that the environment, road uh, designers, and also car manufacturers and so on, uh, vehicle manufacturers that they that they design a system that people people are safe within. I guess that's the kind of my understanding of it and examples of that are a vehicle speed so at, at uh, 50 kilometers per hour or about 40 miles per hour if people are if an unprotected road users hit they're more than 80 percent likely to die and at about 30 kilometers per hour or about 20 miles per hour that risk actually drops to less than 10 percent so these are kind of magnitude of safety figures so that's why there's a push for obviously slower speeds within cities just as an example so so that's a long-winded but hopefully understandable insight into safe systems thinking and within that context correct me if i'm wrong or anything on that or you need to add on to the safe systems thinking but back to that evolution of all the different transport forms what's what's pack's view on on how we design a system that accommodates them okay so there's quite a lot of things there if we just go back to safe system as a starting point um, or perhaps the starting point for safe system in many ways is is vision zero some people might say it's not quite the same as safe system itself but anyway it's often it typically goes together so a, a long-term aim to to bring down the um, numbers of people killed and seriously injured to as near to zero as possible and, and and to design the system around that so we stop saying it's acceptable to kill x or seriously injure x thousand hundreds of thousands of people every year you know as a sort of cost of transport um so that's where safe system starts and i think it, 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 there are challenges to safe system from things like micro mobility i mean there are all sorts of challenges from new forms of transport electric powered light etc i think safe system is is quite good at recognizing 
the risks from conventional motor vehicles and you know uh, ha we, we have some very good vehicle safety standards now and we're very keen that the UK adopts what the EU will be adopting in July the vehicle uh, general safety regulations so so new higher safety standards I think the you know the safe system approach is, is quite good at recognizing safe vehicles and then what safe infrastructure looks like safe roads safe roadsides and so forth I think it has tended to assume that anything less than 20 miles an hour was probably safe or safe enough. And I do think we are now going to see increasingly um, what the government, I think, will classify as powered personal transporters, um, which will go relatively slowly. We don't know exactly yet what those speed limits will be, and they'll be relatively light, but still have the potential for people to either uh, the riders to, to die or potentially to uh, seriously injure other people. And that I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, I mean, in terms, some people have suggested that we shouldn't worry about these casualties because uh, they're not cars and therefore they almost don't count as road casualties. They're not dangerous to other people is, is what has been suggested. I mean, if you wind back 40 years ago to when PAX was formed, that was around the seatbelt legislation. And that was Parliament saying, actually, um, the authorities need to take responsibility for public safety and it's not acceptable for you to choose not to wear a seatbelt and kill yourself. Gov you know, the government is going to step in and then that was followed by motorcycle helmets and I think, you know, the government has a responsibility to ensure that new forms of micromobility are as safe as is reasonable. So those are some of the so I think those are some of the challenges, <laughs> and, and and I guess the other sort of uh, challenge, to, one of the other challenges to it is um, getting to the the riders and the users because you know obviously to drive a car or a motorcycle you need a license, you're registered, all those sort of things. That's not the case at the moment for uh, you know for for um, um, e-scooters, um, and and we'll just. I mean, I'm trying not to focus too much on these scooters because I think I think there'll be more, and who knows? In a couple of years' time, it might not be these scooters; it might be something totally different, hoverboards or or something like that. But um, I think you know the 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 uh, profession and the authorities are going to be uh, aware of this. Um, and some of the impacts are not so obvious. Uh, I, I would say there has been a substantial impact on pedestrians. That that's what we are hearing, and. The lived experience is now recognised as, as an important part of the evidence base. And I think a lot of pedestrians, particularly those who are blind or elderly or infirm or uh, in other, vulnerable in other ways, they are they are concerned about this. Um, it's a bit parallel to cyclists worrying about near misses. You know, it may not appear in the casualty stats, but it's it's certainly off putting for cycling. So so there's some thoughts there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd seen in uh, Dr. Rachel Lee from Sustrans was quoted in the paper yesterday saying about the enforcement and this is probably links to the next question about behaviors but about the enforcement need to enforce that that the e-scooters can't be used on on footpaths i guess pavements and that was that was view from sustrans on on the safety particularly reflecting on the safety data that come out but i, I wanted to ask you a bit about behavior because it's an interesting component of safe systems thinking i think there is a bit of need for educating training obviously all of that and and enforcing where where necessary and behavior and some of it's counterintuitive one of our members kate carpenter who's people could listen to a, a couple of interviews which we've done with her before as it, the counterintuitive stuff so some of the training that you think might result in more safe behavior actually results in riskier behavior and skid pan driving is an example of that but i'd like to get your view on on behavior and, and how you see that playing within road safety and kind of some of the interventions that do actually really effectively moderate behavior have you got sort of thoughts on well, that i mean Kate, kate's an excellent expert on this and uh you know it's well worth listening to whatever she was saying but I mean, education is a, is a very big field. You know, it's everything from information campaigns, behavior campaigns, um, drug training. Uh, so it imparts skills, you know, how to how to steer, you know, change gear if you still need to change gear. There's, you know, uh, ride a bicycle, all that sort of stuff. So it's, there's a whole there's a whole range of stuff. Um, and, it, you know, they'd have different functions and different values. I think. 
education in that in the broad sense is absolutely a key part of road safety and road safety uh, campaigns, campaign management, so forth, because first of all, the public just expect it, you know, the media expect it, politicians expect it. Everyone says, well, we, we should educate people, make them more aware, inform them. And we should, we absolutely should. Uh, whether that leads to behaviour change or, or improved behaviour uh, on its own, I mean, obviously, you can impart skills, you can teach someone how to how to drive a car, but whether that would change the way they think and the risks they take is is a much bigger challenge. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it can only, I think, contribute, but I think on its own, it's, it's not enough. And frankly, we've had too many government road safety strategies which have said, well, you know, behaviour is a nice, easy, comfortable, popular option. We'll go for that and we'll, and we'll ignore the evidence and we'll just, we, you know, we'll ignore the nasty things that uh, <laughs> might be more effective. Um, in relation to what Kate was saying about, or you were saying about skid pad training, that there are some bits of education that might be counterproductive. Um, for example, you know, teaching people to drive on, on ice because um, it may give false confidence. You probably won't re remember that particular skill if you're ever called on to use it. And um, uh, as they may then in induce false confidence and probably a better example, which is which is controversial, is around um, young driver training, um, you know, pre-licensing, pre pre, you know, under, under, under 17 car club and those sorts of initiatives, all very well meaning. They do impart skills, whether they give a false level of confidence, um, you know, is, is, is the tricky issue. Um, we know with young drivers, it's about experience and age that brings down the casualty rate. It's not so much about training. So it's a complicated picture. There's been a piece of work that PACs have done that, that's been really well cited about the kind of the risk to the user of the transport mode and then the risk that they pose to other people. And it's it's a really good illustration, I guess, of risk and perhaps kind of visually representing the the update to the highway code about protecting vulnerable users. Could you just it's hard to probably explain that illustration, but could you just give a, a sense of it and, and why you think it captured people's imaginations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this was a short report that Pax produced a couple of years ago called What Kills Most on the Roads? And I can tell you, we spent a long time <laughs> thinking about the title and the way we presented the information because we knew it would be different and controversial. And the, and the reason we did it was uh, I was preparing some evidence for the Transport Select Committee's active travel inquiry. And we all know that uh, cyclists and pedestrians are vulnerable. Um, and what I wanted to see was what was the total level of death and injury associated with a mode because if you obsess about the road user casualty rate you inevitably discourage walking and cycling and probably you ban young drivers as well while you're at it um, and the other side of the coin is of course that um, without imparting it without imputing any blame at all the other part part of the side of the uh, of the equation is that Large, heavy, fast vehicles are the, are the danger. You know, they are uh, what are, due to the laws of physics, um, killing and injuring people. And so we put together some statistics which show both sides, both the vulnerability, the, the casualties, you know, and then also the what else, what other vehicle was involved. And uh, we did that for total numbers. And of course, you know, most people die in a, in a car or in a collision involving a car by far. And I think that in itself is a really important message because people say, well, the problem is all about vulnerable road users. It's all about, you know, it's it's not. If we want to reach vision zero, we have absolutely got to focus on um, car occupants as well as, well as many other categories. Um, and then we also looked at risk to other road users uh, per, per billion kilometres or billion miles driven. And there, of course, <laughs> It's not it's not pedestrians are the risk to other road users. It's not cyclists. It's uh, it's the motor vehicles and, and vans came out particularly highly in that, which rather surprised us. Um, and I think that is an, an, an emerging issue. Um, HGVs obviously too, uh, you know, are, are, are mile driven. HGV drivers and passengers, you know, are pretty safe, but um, unfortunately. Um, you know, they are a risk to vulnerable roaches. So, so that, so that was what we did, and we were really pleased when the following year, um, the Department of Transport picked it up and has continued the analysis in, uh, in the mainstream now. So it's not just PAXs, it's, it's, <laughs> you 
you know, it's now DFT, so which is great. It's hit the hit the mainstream. Uh, I mentioned COVID at the start. Vaccine for vehicles, a PAX report. It's, it's a great title, but uh, could you say a bit more about that? Because I'm interested in the relationship, as sort of mentioned earlier, about about uh, COVID deaths and well, as in uh, the result of lockdown resulting in less road fatalities. But what was your report about in terms of vaccine for? Okay, so <laughs> there's two two things there. Um, I'm glad you like the title. Um, the, our report, as a, as a briefing note, is actually about vehicle safety standards, and it's as I was m- mentioning earlier, uh, we are lobbying, pressing, trying to persuade the government to adopt these new higher vehicle safety regulations. About 15 technologies. Uh, autonomous emergency braking, which detects pedestrians and cyclists, um, what you might call black box data recorders, EDRs, uh, and and the contra- potentially controversial one is intelligent speed assistance, not not mandatory, but advice that tells you if you are exceeding the speed of it. So there's, there's 15 technologies, which UK government, UK institutions like TRL and so forth have helped develop and um, promote and so forth, right up until the month that the, the UK left the EU. And now we think largely due to politics, there's a lot of prevarication about whether and which of these technologies and regulations should be adopted into UK law. So that, that's what that's what the um, vaccine vehicles briefing note is about. And we picked that title because we thought um, that the vaccine has become is the solution to, uh, to to COVID as far as there is a solution. The UK government's rightly proud of it, having adopted it early. So yeah, we, we said if you can do it for vac- for COVID, come on, you can do it for road casualties. Um, so that that's where we're going with that. In relation to sort of, you know, is there a link between road safety and COVID? <laughs> I mean, I think you can or you you could um, see connections. In that COVID came along, thousands of people died and uh, were unwell and are still unwell as a result of it. And the government uh, introduced new laws, new technologies, new systems, uh, awareness campaigns, you know, um, started changing our behaviour in terms of wearing face masks and social distancing and stuff like that. And, and, you know, we're we're on top of it. We're on top of it. Well, at least for now, I hope. And we could, you know, use some of that dynamism and uh, ambition and so forth in relation to road casualties, Um, because I think, you know, it just shows that possible change is possible, quite quite dramatic change, quite rapid change is is possible. Um, So uh, that was, yeah, I think there are the other the other thing, another little point I might like to make in that is that, you know, as we start off by saying, because of the changes in traffic and all all, all sorts of other things. the number of casualties in the UK has come down compared with pre, pre-COVID. And there is evidence, or at least are examples, to say that once society has got rid of, got, sorry, got rid, got used to a lower level of casualties, they tend to sort of lock in those benefits. So after the uh, economic recession in 2008, 2009, when you know there was a lot less traffic and people were driving more slowly because of the fuel price and so forth, certainly a lot, lot less HGV traffic, um, road deaths came down dramatically and, and they didn't rebound two or three years later. It, it, we have had a bit of a plateau since then, but it hasn't gone back up again. And I think there is potential to to have that, to see that with COVID. But it really, you know, the government needs to sort of get on and take advantage of that opportunity and and uh, and lock it in through actions and campaigns and targets and uh, you know, not just hope it happens. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You There's a lot of interesting points you've made in that. I quite like the intelligence speed assistance for bus fleets and for it, you could see how that could become a, particularly in urban areas, it could be a, it could have a herding effect on other transport modes and, and reduce the, the speeds and kind of act as a kind of one of the implementation measures for safe systems thinking in terms of achieving the the 20 mile per hour reduction speeds that have been sought. But I will ask right, a final question then. So you've you've indicated some of the stuff that you'd like to see in terms of vehicle safety regulations. But DFT are about to, uh, we've been long awaited the road safety strategic framework. They're about to launch this. 
what would you like to see in that that you feel that maybe the department's not putting on the table right now? Are there elements that you'd like to really make sure that that that, that the government does pick up and run with, run yeah. with things that, that you've mean, not seen indications that's going to happen? We, we've had some pretty good hints or more than hints from Baroness Veer, the Road Safety Minister, on, on what some of the things that will, that will be in it. And um, it's pretty clear that they are um, committed to uh, introducing a road collision investigation branch, which will be a really uh, major step forward. Big change in policy. Frankly, five years ago, the government said, we don't need this, the police do it. Uh, so that's a very welcome reversal in, in, um, in approach. Um, I think we will finally see a response to the Rose Policing Review and, uh, you know, the various other various um, documents about the inadequacy of current Rose Policing levels and so forth. Um, what we're really hopeful for is that the Home Office will endorse Rose Policing as a strategic policing requirement, which will basically require all police forces to come up to a certain level and coordinate their actions and so forth, rather than a rather sort of ad hoc arrangement at the moment. Um, and there is incidentally a, a, a new Rose Policing strategy just issued, uh, which, which I'm sure will be a positive step forward as well. That's from, from the police or MPCC. Um, I think we will probably see um, more support for the victims of, of road collisions, which is overdue and quite right. Um, there'll be an endorsement of a safe system approach. Um, whether it's an endorsement of all aspects of the safe system approach, we, <laughs> we will see. Uh, where I don't know, and I'm not so optimistic, is around targets. You know, we, we would say, uh, you know, the government has adopted targets and a whole range of things, um, you know, net zero, um, four hour wait time, you know, et cetera. Why What's not? Yeah. Interesting. You, you mentioned COVID. They did set targets for, I mean, in terms of vaccinations, and, and that was obviously one of the elements that was a success. That, that, that there was a target underpinning that drive to get get vaccinations out and get people vaccinated. So presumably there would be a logic to having targets for achieving reductions in road casualties. But I mean, that's no, just... absolutely, there would. I mean, we, you know, the UK pioneered. Um, national road safety target, national casualty reduction targets, and um, use them successfully. And it's just a shorthand for saying we are we are committed to bringing down, you know, the number of, of deaths and serious injuries. And the government's endorsed the UN target of 50% uh, casualty reduction uh, to 2030. Um, and many parts of the country have got targets. Scotland, you know, the Scottish government has adopted targets. Um, the government has given targets to national highways uh, to implement. And uh, London has um, has a casualty reduction target, um, and many of many local authorities do too. So, you know, it's almost filling in the gap and joining them joining them up. But anyway, so that's that's we we feel a part of it, which we're not confident will be there. Um, and then there's some stuff around performance monitoring. You know, part the, the safe system approach is not just about doing the same old stuff and having targets. It is saying, let's look at the safety of the system. So the percentage of vehicles that are complying with the speed limit, for example, or driving at a safe speed, if you, um, if we can have that sophistication, um, the percentage of vehicles which, which have a five star safety rating, um, percentage of drivers who are wearing seat belts, uh, you know, that th those are factors which professionals can influence and, and we should be monitoring because that's what's likely to bring down the number of casualties at the end of the day. Um, so we shouldn't have to rely on a pandemic coming along to meet a target. Well, thank you. That was David Davis, Executive Director of PAX. Thank you for listening to this CHT podcast and thank you very much, David, for giving us your time today. Pleasure. Pleasure. Enjoy it, Justin. Joining a professional body has never been more important. Join thousands of other professionals just like you who are getting ahead with CIHT membership. Go to the CIHT website and discover exclusive resources and why the leaders and future leaders of the sector are members with CIHT.